Good morning. And uh, yeah, so we are about to start the fifth day of the session uh, of the summer school. Um, today's, uh, the first talk would be by N. Raja, I mean, who flew in yesterday and uh, has agreed to give his uh, talk on uh, ontology of computers programs. Um, I'll, I would just um, try to introduce, uh, formally introduce him. Dr. N. Raja is a faculty member in the social, the School of Technology and Computer Science, T Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, India. He completed his master's degree at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and his PhD at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He has held visiting positions at the University of Nijmegen, Netherlands, EPFL, Louisiana, Switzerland, the University of Paris, France, and the Isaac Newton Institute, Cambridge University, UK. He is a member of the editorial board of the journal Logic Logica Universalis and the associate, associate editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Computing, Technology, and Information Security, and also a guest editor of Sadhana, the engineering journal of Indian Academy of Sciences. He is on the adjunct faculty of the International Center for Theoretical Sciences in Bangalore and also a principal investigator at the Center for Formal Development and Verification of so Software in IIT Mumbai. His research interests include type theory and interactive theorem, theorem proving, formal methods, models of distributed computing, and interacting processes, uh, and philosophy of computer science. So I formally uh, thank Raja to come and start the lecture. Good morning once again. Um, I wanted to be here the whole week, but unfortunately could not manage. So by, by training, I'm a computer scientist and I have background in mathematics and engineering. I'm not a philosopher at all, you know. I mean, in the sense, I don't have formal background in philosophy, though I like to call myself a philosopher. By the end of the talk, you'll see how much pretensions I have, you know? okay? So, all right. So the little bit of philosophy that I know, I learned by reading myself, so it's not, uh, I mean, it's, it's not a very structured way of learning things. All right, so um, one of my research interests is the philosophy of computer science. And I thought I'd give you some brief glimpses into this area. It's, um, so computer science itself started, if you look at the beginnings of computer science, the, the work started in, in logic, in, in the philosophy of mathematics. And, um, and that's where the origins of computer science lie, in the foundations of in the philosophy of mathematics, in the foundations of mathematics. And, um, and a lot of philosophical focus has gone on into the very early beginnings of computer science. Okay? So there's a lot of philosophical studies at the time when this thing started, around 1936, when the first uh, notion of computation was formalized. But then people have tended to ignore later day developments in computer science and, and tended to ignore or not focus on philosophical aspects of those things. Yeah? So this, uh, this looks at later day developments. So in the sense that it looks at computer programs, programs as we use them, as we understand them. Yeah? So everybody uses some program or the other, even the browser that you use. Yeah? If you are on Facebook, you use browsers, uh, you use uh, just simple networking on the web. So there are a lot of computer programs. So when I say computer program, I'm going to be meaning these objects, you know, which people write even, I mean, if you have some very basic training in, in computer programming, even some simple things like writing out a program to print hello on the screen, you know, as simple objects as that. So we want to look at ontology of, of these things. And uh, like I said, there is very little studies on, on these. You know, and, uh, and we don't have final answers to these. So there are interesting issues, and people are looking, look, trying to, trying to look at it more carefully. So I have, um, I have plenty of slides. I don't know whether I can show you all of it. So let me begin by showing you the most important slide in the whole thing. Yeah. So there it is. So thanks a lot to Sundar for giving me the opportunity to be here, and thanks to Warren for all the, for his help with all the arrangements. <laughs> okay. 
So, all right. So now that we are done with the most important part, let's focus on, let's look at uh, less important things. Okay. So, so when I, when I mean, when I accepted, or when I wrote to Sundar that I'd be able to speak here, I was not, I didn't know the background of the people who would be attending. Yeah? And yesterday I could speak to some of the people during the museum visit. And uh, so I have a little bit of idea. So I can very quickly summarize my whole talk with just this slide. Yeah? So, so my original idea was to look at the influence of Platonism and formalism. So these things come from the philosophy of mathematics. Yeah? And look at their uh, impact or, or look at the ontology of computer programs from this perspective. But I think this is too crazy. Yeah, I, I don't think many of the students here have any background in, in the philosophy of mathematics, and I'm not sure these terms make any sense at all. So, so I'm going to try something else. So what, we are, what I'll do is um, we look, try to look at ontology of computer programs, and um, and I'll try to, instead of, instead of looking at these things, I'll try to show you what kind of difficulties arise when you try to develop an ontology of computer programs. Okay? So what are the issues? So this subject is related to philosophy, I mean, philosophical studies from two different uh, directions. One is the philosophy of mathematics, and the other is philosophy of language. You know, computer languages are some kind of language. They're not natural languages, they're kind of artificial languages. But, uh, so, um, all right, so here is um, motivation or the beginning that comes from philosophy of language. Yeah. So, so you're given a language and you're trying to say what do its expressions mean. Yeah. So, and, um, and if you can come up with this, then you call it a semantics for that language, okay? So, so the question is, what, what would be required of such a theory of a semantics of an ontology before, I mean, we can, before we can say that it has accomplished its aim or it has done its, I mean, accomplished it in an optimal way, okay? So, so, the, um, all right. So this, this question that I showed you just now, it comes from a well-established philosophical program from the philosophy of natural language, you know? So it's called the davidson dummett program. So you want to come up with a theory of meaning. Yeah? So, so in natural language, you're trying to look at relations between language and reality, between mind and language. Yeah? So, all right. um, so let's switch context. So in, in theoretical computer science, there is a similar area of study, which is called semantics of computer languages, or just simply called semantics. And so the idea is likewise to develop a formal account of the meaning of a computer language, and to use that account to answer interesting questions. So, um, so what kind of questions? These questions could even be completely practical. So, for example, given a program, you may want to formally verify using the semantics, using the ontology, using the semantics that you have. You may want to verify that the language that you have did indeed uh, do what it it, has, it claims to do. Yeah. So if you have a specific program and then that somebody says this program accomplishes so and so task, now how do you even verify that this claim is true? Yeah. So having a semantics, having a clear idea of meaning of programs, um, so that's a practical goal and this notion of an ontology of semantics would help in, or at least the attempt is it may, it should try and help these, answer these questions. So. And uh, you may also want to answer some more general questions. So one of them is you want to design a computer language, and uh, it's often good to start with the semantics. You know? So I want a language with so-and-so semantics, and then how do I design it? So this has not been historically the way computer languages evolved. In the very beginning, or the first languages, computer languages that were proposed, most of the syntax and semantics was just developed in an ad hoc way. Yeah, because people didn't know how to do all these things. So more major effort was in trying to write what were called compilers and trying to implement these languages on a machine. So all the focus was on that and people didn't even know how to write down a syntax clearly before and even, I mean, semantics was too far remote. 
Okay. So, all right. So another question that you may want to answer if with these studies is you want to classify existing computer languages. You know? So if you look at computer languages, you see that some of them are more similar to each other and some of them are merely what are called just notational variants. You know? So you have a way of writing some expression in one language. You can just, with just uh, some mere uh, syntactic changes, you can rewrite it and it will become a valid program in another language. So such languages are not really different. So they are just notational variants. But then there are languages which are completely different from each other. You know? So we want these uh, studies of ontologies to be able to help us to classify these languages, to be able to identify when some are similar, when they are essentially different. So, so we want to be able to put these observations on a more formal footing. And, um, and, f and we may also want to say something about the nature of computation on the basis of these languages, you know, and the way we express computations in these languages. So, all right. Mm. So when people try to write on, uh, come up with ontologies of languages, so, um, first attempt, uh, was to try and see, I mean, it, uh, some, it looks immediately as a natural extension of work in mathematics. So f people in philosophy of mathematics have been wondering about nature of mathematical objects, what are they, I mean, this is where I, I had the very first slide, this Platonism, formalism comes from that, you know. So, so it looked as if we may already have clear-cut answers from the philosophy of mathematics. So just go to the library, pick up a book on philosophy of mathematics, and tailor all that work to, to philosophy of, of computer languages. But it turns out that it doesn't work well that way. Okay? So, so I thought I'll turn my attention to show you what are the difficulties that come up with in computer languages which you don't find in mathematical languages? I mean, mathematics also uses a language. It's some kind of an artificial language which has been, which has developed uh, over several centuries. Okay? And when you try to look at ontologies or if you try to look at semantics of mathematical languages, I mean, a lot of good solutions have, have been proposed, but it turns out you cannot carry them over directly to, to do computer languages. Okay, so, so let me try to show you some of the major differences which computer languages pose. So what am I trying to do now? It, um, so starting now, I'm trying to show you some basic uh, essential differences in computer languages which cause problems in, in coming up with an ontology for them. So, um, so let's start. I met some people yesterday during the talk, uh, during the museum tour who are studying English literature. So I thought it may be better to start with something from English literature. Yeah. All right. So, so the point I'm trying to go through this, can I tell you? So, all right. So here is a, something called the Grelling paradox, which was, uh, so this is a logical paradox. This was discovered by Russell, Button Russell. And Grelling formulated it in terms of English adjectives. So what do we have? So we are looking at adjectives in the English language. And we are trying to identify properties of adjectives. So we'll say that an adjective is autological if it applies to itself. Okay? Um, so here is an example. Polysyllabic has several syllables. So it applies to itself. So we'll say the adjective polysyllabic is autological. And we'll say that an adjective which is not autological is heterological. Okay? So for example, the word long, it, it's not a long word. You know? <laughs> so it doesn't apply to itself. So it is, it is heterological. All right? So I'll give you some and more examples. Say it's not long, so yeah. Why would you say it's not long? OK, so probably that's not a good example. I mean, there are just four <laughs> alphabets in there. So I'll give you better examples of heterological. You know? I'll give you better examples. So here is something which you cannot contest. For example, <laughs> hyphenated and high and hyphenated. Right? Okay. So short and long are not two good examples. So polysyllabic and monosyllabic seem more uh, more appropriate. And then there are things which are not kind of understandable, which say autological, abstract, I put under heterological. So you can contest these things. Yeah. But English itself is an English word. Yeah. But French is not a word in the French language. 
So if I am trying to identify English words, the adjective English applies to all words in the English language, and in particular it applies to itself. So it is autological. But in French, I don't know French. Apparently in French you say Francais. You know? So French is not a French word. And then, uh, and then, so, and then we have these examples that I told you. So, so now you have some idea of what is autological, what is cytological, right? Okay. So the next question that we ask is, what about the adjective heterological? Is it autological or is it heterological? So this is a question to students here. So, so tell me. So raise your hands. How many of you say that heterological is autological? Huh? Autological. One. Done. How many more claim that heterological is autological? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Good. Very nice. Oh, it's impressive. Usually, I give if I if I had given this talk to a computer science audience, usually there's no response. Yeah? <laughs> no response. So very nice. Okay. So. I mean, that was another thing that told me, Warren told me that I have one hour talk and 30 minutes of discussion. This is completely new to me. <laughs> Usually, if you give a talk, seminar in mathematics, there is, there is, there is 59 minutes of talk and one minute of questions. <laughs> that's about it. Okay, so that's the format I'm used to. So let's see how badly I do on this. Okay. All right. So now there are, uh, all right. So what, how many of you say that it is heterological? So I asked you how many of you claim that heterological is autological and I got eight, nine answers. And uh, so the next question is how many of you say that heterological is heterological? So there's one person. Huh? If it becomes heterological, then it becomes yeah, heterological. No, no, okay, no, you reason to yourself. Just tell me the final answer. Okay, so let's look at it. So there are two possible answers to this. So suppose you say it is autological. Yeah. Then what does it mean? By definition, it applies to itself. All right. I mean that's the definition of autological. Now, if heterological applies to itself, then it must be heterological. Right. So this shows that our answer is self-contradictory. Okay. So you know, if you've not seen these kind of arguments before, just read it slowly. Yeah. Okay. It's, <laughs> you know, you're convinced with this. I mean this. I mean, this is clean reasoning. There is no, there is no problem in this. So, so if you start off with the with the hypothesis that uh, is that heart, heterological is autological, you end up with a contradiction. Yeah. So it doesn't work. So, so what it about? Applies to itself, it's autological. It's after, after yeah. the second. Yeah, yeah. So we say that something is autological if it truly applies to itself. Yeah. So if I say that if heterological is autological then it should apply to itself. If it applies to itself, it claims that what it says, what it claims about itself is true. Yeah. And it claims that heterological, yeah. so, so it will turn out that it doesn't apply to itself. Yeah. So there's a problem. So what about the other thing? Suppose we say heterological is heterological. So, so immediately you can see that it applies to itself. We're claiming that heterological is heterological, so it applies to itself. Yeah. So by this, you know that it is therefore autological, because here is an adjective that applies to itself. So it should be autological. So once again, you get a contradiction. Yeah. So, so, yeah, somebody had a question? Okay. So both these answers um, don't seem to help. So what do we do? Yeah. So, so both of these answers lead to self-contradiction. So what's the question? So if you look at the literature in philosophy, people have come up with several ingenious ideas to answer this question. But the most simple solution is not to give any answer at all. Yeah. Okay. So, so the conclusion that you can draw from this paradox is that you cannot answer this question at all. There is no answer to this question. All right. Sorry. Okay. So, all right. So, um, so why did I show you this? So this comes from actually philosophy of mathematics. There's something called Russell's paradox in the foundations of mathematics, yeah, which caused a major stir, a major uh, 
major chaos in the foundations. People, had, people thought that they kind of worked out foundations of mathematics very well. And Russell came up with a question like this, which you can formulate very clearly in set theory. You know? There you're not talking about English language. I mean, meanings of words are not clear. Sometimes the same word has several meanings. You know? So it looks on the face of it that such questions would not be, it would not be possible to pose such things in something like mathematics. But it turns out that's not true. And Russell had a formulation of this, which is called Russell's paradox. So usually when you have a, when you have a theorem in mathematics, either it's true or it's false. Yeah. If you make a statement, a proposition in mathematics, yeah, either it is true or it is false. It can't be both together. So if I can find a proposition which is both true and false, the whole edifice of mathematics collapses. Yeah. Then you can show that everything is true, everything is false. There's no distinction between true and false entities. And you end up talking complete nonsense. Yeah. So if something like this can come up in mathematics, there's something very serious. Yeah. So all right. So before we pick up the thread, let's see what does a computer do if you pose this problem to a computer. Okay. I mean, this question of is heterological, logical, or is it heterological? Suppose I ask a computer to answer this question, what would it do? So what does it mean? I write a computer program to solve this problem and see what answer do I get at the end of it. So, so any guesses? How many of you think the computer would say it is uh, that, that heterological is autological? <coughs> Yeah, this is difficult to answer unless if you have had some experience with programming. Okay, so let let me not let's go on. Okay, so all right, so let's see how does a computer handle this question. Uh, so so what I'm going to do is I take a language called Lisp. So don't get worried about this. This is a very simple language. So this whole line is a complete Lisp program yeah, without anything missing. Okay. So I'll just explain how this goes. So so here is. Uh, is a program to find out whether something is heterological. What does it do? It takes an argument, all right, which is P. Yeah, this is called an argument. This is the input you give to this program. So heterological is a program which expects an input, which we, are, which we have labeled P. And then it tries to apply this input P to itself. Okay? And, and then if P applied to itself turns out to be true, you know, then P is not heterological. Yeah? Because P applied to itself is true, P is autological. So the question whether P is heterological, you have to negate it. So this is a negation symbol, not of P applied to P. Okay? So, if I, so if I give the word, uh, if I apply, if I give this word hyphenated to this program, okay? so how does this evaluate? It tries to heterological applied to hyphenated. So you apply hyphenated applied to hyphenated. Yeah. So hyphenated is not hyphenated. So hyphenated applied to hyphenated gives me false. Yeah. And uh, so that is false. Heterological should be true. So we negate the result. Yeah. So, so this is a program in Lisp. You could have written this in any other language as well. In Java, in C, yeah, C sharp, or any of the thousand other languages. Yeah. So all right. So what do we do? So now we come back to this question of is heterological, autological, or heterological. So we, um, so we ask the computer to evaluate this. Is heterological? Is it heterological? So what does it do? The computer uh, just uh, substitutes heterological for this p. Yeah? Just erase this p, write down heterological in that place, similarly on the right hand side. Okay? So this is my program. This is the details of the program. And it will try to evaluate heterological applied to heterological and then negate the answer. Yeah. So in order to compute this, it tries to do this. Okay. Now it doesn't know how to do this. So again, it has to look up. So here is something heterological. And it has to find out whether that is true of its argument. So it will go back to the definition of heterological, the same program. And then it tries to apply that. Yeah, and then to, once again to do that, it has to evaluate this, and it will keep going on like this. Yeah. So, so what happens? The computation never finishes, yeah. and the computer will not give you any answer, in which I already suggested is the most sensible response to this. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't give you an answer at all. It just keeps on going on and on. Okay. So, all right. So, um, so 
Here is the here is the first difference from the from the studies in philosophy of uh, mathematics. So in computer science, you had to um, you had to model what is called non-termination. So in mathematics, this doesn't arise. So I have a mathematical entity, you know, which is kind of static. If there are some dynamic rules, you will apply them. But finally, you always come to some stop. You know. The whole process ends. I mean, it may take years, centuries to go on, but finally, it will come to a stop. But here in computer science, there is, if you are looking at computer programs, there is a notion of non-termination. So if you are trying to develop an ontology of computer programs, you have to have a specific way to model this notion of non-termination. Okay. So, all right. so in mathematics, this Russell's paradox created problems. So, but, uh, but in, as in computer programming, this is not a problem at all. Non-termination is something everybody encounters. You try to do anything which is slightly sophisticated programming, non-trivial programming, you'll end up with programs which don't terminate at all. Okay. So this is a commonplace issue. Yes, Lawrence. Yes, I was using the keywords. Like, for example, in Java, I can't use class as a string. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to mathematician. They use it very often. Okay. So what does it say? It says that okay, so we can go read and read this. And then we say that factorial of zero is one, factorial of one is one. For any other number, just keep multiplying by one. So what does this say? It says that if the the input that you are given to this program, if it is zero, then stride forward, return the answer as one. Okay. If the input that was provided was not zero, then you try to do some computation. So you take this input x and multiply it with something else. What is that something? Which is again factorial applied to a diminished value of x. Okay. So this program is again going to invoke itself, but with a different argument. Okay. And you can see this will go on. Factorial x minus 1, suppose if I had started with 10, now I need to compute factorial of 9. You know? And then factorial of 9 will need factorial of 8. So you keep on going like this until it reaches the value 0. And then you can backtrack and build up uh, what we have, you know? the true value of factorial of 10. So, so, this, so if I, write, I can write this, I mean, this is a computer program itself. And you can translate this in a very straightforward way to any other language. And you'll get very sensible answers to all these questions you post to the computer. Factorial of 0, 3, factorial of this. You know? but, if, but if you try to do factorial of minus 1, then you are in problem now. Okay? <laughs> then this computation will never terminate. You know? So if I start with a positive value, I stop when I reach 0. But in the beginning, if I start with a negative value, then, then this computation goes on forever. You know? so, so what is it that I'm trying to illustrate? Recursion, uh, so this is called recursion. I, what I'm, whatever I'm trying to define, I use the same thing in its definition. Okay? So this is not complete nonsense. Recursion makes sense. You know, and here is a sensible use of it. And there are several such uses in mathematics. Um, if you are a bit careful with recursion, you can get very sensible answers. Of course, you can lead to, to complete uh, non-termination if you try to use it in an undisciplined way. Okay? So, so just throwing out recursion is not going to help us. Okay? I mean, rec we want to retain recursion. And uh, okay. Um, okay, so let's skip this. So all right, so this is the thing that I was telling you. So computation, so we have this property of non-termination. Okay. Mm. So let me let me show you the next problem that comes here. It's the problem of So when you try to do ontological studies of computer programs, and then you turn to, to the philosophy of mathematics, to foundations of mathematics, like we said, one new feature that we have to deal with is non-termination. And the other feature that, we, that is essential, that becomes essential to be able to handle is called self-application. Okay? So, um, so if you go back to heterological, there are two difficulties with heterological. One was, it was occurring on the right hand side. And not just that, it occurred in an even more complicated way. We tried to apply heterological to itself. Okay? There's some kind of a self application that we are doing. All right? So probably if we if we disallow this, if we abandon the notion of self application, we can still do recursion. You know? See, recursion is different from self application. This program is recursive, but it is not doesn't do self application. Factorial always applies to a number. It doesn't apply to factorial any time. Okay? So I want to be able to retain recursion. So these are, type theoretically, they are different entities. This is a function, this is a number. Okay? I'm always applying number functions to numbers. I never apply functions to functions. So probably if I put in this restriction, you know, then maybe I can get out of this, these kind of problems and use standard uh, mathematical ontologies to be able to 
to study computer programs. Okay, so that's the next thing that I'm speak going to speak about. Okay, so um, let's see. So, so what we what is our next exercise? Um, so there are some programs that don't terminate. So what if I try to eliminate them right in the beginning? Yeah. I'm trying to assign meanings to programs, and here is a problematic entity, programs that don't terminate. So I'm trying to eliminate this from my domain completely. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to, um, to do now, and let's see how far we can succeed. Yeah. So so our next um, problem that we set ourselves is to write a program which can kind of um, um, which can identify whether so okay so I have a program with me I want to be able to identify whether this does go into non-termination or will it stop sometime and give me an answer all right so probably then I can eliminate things like heterological. Since I know right from the beginning that it's not going to terminate, I don't try to do those things. So practically also, even if you're not interested in, you may think this is pathological, trying to find out whether heterological is heterological. Yeah, even otherwise, there are non-termination is a serious issue in computer programming. Yeah? I mean, this comes up very often. You, you're writing something, you write on a program to solve it. it. It keeps on, it doesn't seem to produce an answer. Now you don't know what to do. You know, to wait, wait for a few more minutes, wait for a few days, a few weeks, or to pull the plug, switch off the computer, throw it outside the window, you don't know what to do, yeah? So maybe, so, so there are several people, if you meet people in physics departments, biology departments, they have programs that run for weeks, yeah? So if you write very trivial programs, you have your answer in less than a second probably. But there are sensible programs that take long to, com to compute, yeah? So what, what I want now, is be able to have a method to, to identify whether this thing will terminate or whether this will not terminate. Yeah? So, all right. So, uh, so this is what I need now. I'm trying to program a, write a program, which I call terminates, which takes two inputs. It takes a function f and it takes an argument. And then it tries to find out that if I apply, try to apply f to x, Will this, in principle, will this terminate, or will it never terminate? Okay. So this is what I am trying to find out. So, so this terminates f of x will just give me a yes/no answer. Yeah. If f applied to x terminates, then this will say true or yes. Or and if f applied to x doesn't terminate, then it will say false. Doesn't work. Yeah. Um, it will not give you what is the value of f applied to x. We are not interested in that. Yeah? So, for example, this f could be factorial and x could be 10. All we are interested in is factorial applied to 10 will terminate and give me a sensible answer. While factorial applied to minus 1 will not terminate. Okay? So, all right. So, here are some illustrative runs of this. So, factor terminates when given inputs factorial and 0 will give me true. Yeah? While if it's given factorial and minus one, it gives me false. All right. Okay. So now if I have a program like this, then I can go back to my problem of heterology. Yeah. And I can try to reprogram this uh, heterology function. Yeah. So instead of I'm I don't want to allow the option of keeping quiet. I don't want the computer to remain quiet and not produce an answer. Yeah. I want to force it to give me an answer to what is this heterological? Is it heterological or autological? Yeah. So can I prevent this kind of uh, non-termination? And uh, probably this might help us. Yeah. So, so we use, so, so where was the problem? The problem was in, in heterological applied to itself. So now we modify our program. We'll say that a function is, uh, is autological if, if you try to apply it to itself, then it it stops, it terminates, and gives you the value true. Okay, if it doesn't terminate, then I'm willing to classify it as heterological. Okay, I mean there are several adjectives in the English language; they all seem to fit into this very nicely. Okay, and there's just one pathological case, heterological, which is creating problems for us. Maybe it's an isolated instance. Probably there are not more like that. Yeah, maybe I can just get rid of this and and continue to live in a peaceful world, yeah? Okay, 
So, so that's what we are attempting. So we say use the same program, modify it slightly. Um, if, if I apply it autological to itself and it gives me an answer true, yeah, then I know it's autological. If it gives me the answer false, I know it's heterological. If it doesn't terminate, then I'm willing to accept it's heterological and end the debate, okay? So that's what we are trying to do. So, um, okay. All right, so here is uh, here is um, attempt to to program this again in a different way. So yeah, so here is the same heterological program written with the help of this function terminates. Okay, so heterological of f. So if f applied to f will terminate in principle. Okay, so I'm not actually going to do this computation. Terminates tell me well whether this in principle will terminate or not. Yeah, if it will terminate, then only I do this self-obligation and I negate the answer. Yeah, if it doesn't terminate, so if, see, so, all right, so let's try to parse this. What does this mean? So there are three parts to this. There is a if, and here is a operation which gives you what is called a Boolean value, a true or a false. Yeah, I evaluate this condition. If this condition turns out to be true, then I go to the part that follows the then. Yeah, so this is supposed to have two branches. There is a condition evaluation, and there is a branch after then, and another branch after else. Okay? So if this condition evaluates to true, then I do this. If this condition evaluates to false, then I switch to the other branch. Okay? So if, if I know in principle that f applied to f is going to terminate, only then I go into this then branch, and I do the self-application. Okay? If, if I already know it's not going to terminate, then I have something like heterology then I don't try to do this at all. I just switch to the else branch, okay? So, all right. Um, so we have a different program now. It's modified. Earlier program I had called, what did I, I had called it heterological, right? This was a program that we had. So now I have a different program. I just change its name a little bit. I call it hetero, okay? So here is the hetero program, which is changed. So, all right, so like I said, uh, our, we thought probably heterological is the only such crazy thing, you know? Okay, mm, so we can eliminate heterological with this solution. But then it turns out that heterological is not as isolated instance of an example, you know? As soon as I have this, I, immediately another one crops up, okay? So what is that? So now I try to find out whether this uh, function hetero is it hetero itself or not? Okay. Just like trying to find out. So, so okay. So, this is another notion. So, there is a notion of higher order functions. Yeah? I mean, you have the English words, you have classified them neatly using adjectives, okay? Now you can apply this notion of what the adjective says to the adjective itself, okay? And then you can go one level higher, you can go one level higher, you can keep doing this, yeah? So in English, it looks like some kind of a childish exercise, yeah? But in computer science, these things are very useful, yeah? In computer programs, you very often have things which are higher order. I have one program which operates on another, okay? And then I can have a higher level entity which operates on a program which operates on another program. Yeah? I mean, a lot of technology that you see, uh, information technology is actually built on, on these things. Yeah? If we don't allow this, a lot of programs will collapse. Yeah? You, you will not be able to build systems which, which sustain. Yeah? So this higher order notion is, is very crucial in, in computer programs. Yeah? So in mathematics, you can, you can kind of limit yourself to three levels and still do very non-trivial mathematics and not go about it, you know, and you can still live in a, in a happy um, situation. But it doesn't turn out to be so in, computers, in computer programs. So if you are trying to do ontology of computer programs, you'll have to be able to deal with higher order functions, higher order to any degree, okay, as much as you want, okay? All right, so here is our first attempt to go slightly higher order. I'm trying to apply hetero to hetero, okay? So how does this go? Um, so if I apply, so if I, if I know that um, um, 
hetero applied to hetero terminates, yeah, then, then I try to compute hetero of hetero and negate the result. Okay? And if it doesn't terminate, then I go to true straight away. Yeah? So this, I mean, at first it looks as if I will not face the problem of heterological with this program. Yeah? But let's see what happens if I try to evaluate this. Yeah? So, okay. Um, so the condition that we have is um, this program is going to um, okay. So all right. So how does this um, to how does this evaluate? What how does what evaluate? I'm trying to evaluate hetero applied to hetero. Okay. So um, if hetero applied to hetero terminates, if terminates returns to be true, then I go into this. So this is a, what is called a constant function. It's just a negation that this negation itself will not lead me into non-termination. If I give it a value true, it will give me false. If I give it a value false, it gives me true. Yeah? I already know that hetero applied to hetero terminates, and this is not going to add any complications, the negation, and I have an answer which will terminate. Okay? But on the other hand, if this doesn't terminate, then I go straight to the other branch, which is true. So what, what have we reasoned out here? Whatever may be the case, this program should always terminate. Okay, I don't know what answer I'm going to get of hetero applied to hetero, but it should not go into non-termination. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Mm. So, so if I try to evaluate this now, and uh, so I try to apply hetero to hetero. Okay, and so what does this do? It, uh, it. So you do this computation, and then. You are and you end up holding something very similar once more, yeah. So, so you end up with with the similar stuff. Hetero applied to hetero is negation of hetero applied to hetero, okay. And and there doesn't seem to be any way to get out of this. So so where does the problem lie in this program? The, um, so so here once again we obtain a contradiction, but we can find out there is something which we have assumed in our program that there is a computation called terminates which is it's possible to program something like this yeah that this is available to you okay so it turns out that this is one of the impossibility results in in computer programs there are programs which you cannot write okay in the sense that uh, i mean we are not talking about we are not ask uh, so what is the question we are trying to ask is there a very well posed problem for which there doesn't exist a computer programming solution. Okay, so I'm not I'm not asking questions like can a computer program write poetry? You know, can it write an epic? You know, then and then and then, and then I'm not trying to answer that. I'm trying to pose a very well posed mathematical problem. You know, and then claiming that there is no computer program which exists to solve it. So this terminates is one such program. Uh, it just takes a pair of arguments and tells me whether this uh, uh, argument applied to the other will in principle terminate or not. Yeah? So this turns out uh, this is an impossibility result and uh, it is of the same class as, as what? Wait. So there are several impossibility results in in mathematics, okay? So, or in physics, yeah. So you can, in principle, you, you know that in principle you cannot build a perpetual motion machine, irrespective of what technology you use, whether you use steam engines, whether you use petroleum, whether you use solar energy, you just cannot build a perpetual motion machine, yeah. Um, so this impossibility of this programming of this terminates function is something in that class. You know? It's called uh, the unsolvability of the halting problem. Okay? There are programs which, which, cannot be, which cannot be, which don't exist in the sense that you just, however hard you try to search for a solution, it's not there. You know? It's not that you're not uh, smart enough to be able to find a solution. In principle, a solution doesn't exist. Okay? So,
So incomputability is another thing. So we say if, if the program is impossible to be to write, we say it's incomputable. So I can go on on this list. So there are several such uh, issues that crop up in in the philosophical study of computer programs. If you're when you're trying to build an ontology for it, you know, and uh, and these issues have not been tackled in traditional mathematics. You know, so you need answers to this. So we don't have final answers yet. So people have come up with solutions which overcome this, but still there is a lot of work to be done in trying to, to address them in a more systematic way, which, uh, which, is, which more people agree that the, the solution is indeed sensible and useful. So, so let me try to make sense of this slide. So traditionally in mathematics, people have tried to find out answers to to what is the ontology of mathematical objects. So like for example, you can ask a question, what is a number? Yeah, you use numbers all the time, one, two, three, four, yeah, as many as you like. But what is a number actually? Yeah? What is the meaning of a number? Yeah. If you think I'm talking completely, I'm gone crazy, yeah? It, this was a question posed by Barton and Russell. There's a whole paper where he tries to address this. And there are whole three volumes of principles of mathematics. It's called Principia Mathematica, where it tries to start solving this question, try to address this question: What is a number? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so even before Barton and Russell in 1906, people traditionally, right from the Greeks, people have tried to wonder about mathematical objects. What are they? What is their ontological status? You know, geometric figures. So, one traditional solution has been what is called Platonism. You know. So if I'm trying to ask a question, what is a circle? Yeah, what is a triangle? So one answer is there is something notion, there is a notion of a perfect circle which resides somewhere in the heavens yeah, or in the mind of God uh, somewhere. Yeah. So there is a platonic reality to, to the mathematical objects. And what you are trying to study in mathematics is actually trying to come closer and closer to that. But the real meaning of mathematical objects exists in a universe independent of, of mathematics. Yeah. So that's called, it's called Platonism. Yeah? It comes from Plato. And uh, while the other, um, while the other uh, notion to ontological of mathematical objects is something called formalism, which came up much later with David Hilbert in, in Gottingen. Yeah? So it's clearly Platonism, there are issues with Platonism. People don't agree with, I mean, I mean, it does sound a bit strange. So Hilbert said that there is, Mathematical objects are what you can do with them. Yeah? So, you dis so there are rules to manipulate them. Yeah? You use them according to their rules and there is nothing more to it. That's all the meaning, that's all the reality or uh, the truth or whatever, the ontology of those mathematical objects. Okay? So this is a traditional dichotomy in philosophy of mathematics. I mean, there are very deep studies in both these directions trying to justify one, refute the other. Yeah? So, but, uh, so so there is always this debate between Platonism and formalism. So you can try to apply the same stuff here. So where do, so where, what's the status of Platonism now? People don't have to, uh, to appeal to heaven or the mind of God. So there is a theory called So there is a theory called set theory, you know? So all, uh, if I want ontological status of mathematical objects, you just see its translation in set theory. Yeah? So set theory is supposed to be some kind of a foundational theory. So you can take any branch of mathematics and you can translate it to set theory. You can take group theory, you can take analysis, you can take algebra, you can take topology. In principle, you can reduce it back to set theory. And then see what do those notions, suppose you are trying to study topology, and I want to see the ontological status of topological objects, just see what do they correspond to set theory, okay? And set theory serves as some kind of a platonic universe to define the meaning of, of entities in mathematics, okay? So, so computer science, for computer programs also, people try to use set theory as some kind of a universe to build ontologies, but then, like I said, there are a lot of other issues which crop up along the way, which, which show, which, which makes set theory very difficult to handle as a base, as an ontological base for, for computer programs, okay? Um, so the, the reason for that is these kind of issues, when people are trying to formalize mathematics, they encountered some of these issues 
and mathematics was re-engineered. I mean, it, it sound, mathematics looks like a very natural stuff to several people, but it has been carefully built up over several centuries you know, to be able to accomplish certain kind of task and make it uh, impossible to do certain other things. And mathematics and set theory in, in particular has been engineered, has been built in such a way that you cannot do these kind of things in set theory. You know? And now suddenly you have a new, a new domain, a new area, which demands that all these things cannot be thrown away. Okay? Set theory throws away self-application. Yeah, it throws off lots of stuff. Yeah, it studies only what are, I mean, it focuses on what are called total functions. I mean, so I mean, in principle, there are lots of issues that come up in in programming languages, which have been consciously been thrown away in set theory. So traditional mathematical ontologies don't work here. And then, uh, and so the next appeal is to is to is to look at formalism, you know. And so this formalism in 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 ontology of computer programs is, you say the meaning of so you try to translate this computer program into another into another system and say the meaning of these programs lies on lies in this, okay. And one um, and a language which is used for translation. It's called the lambda calculus. So just as set theory proved to be some kind of a canonical object in, in mathematics, there is something called the lambda calculus, which evolved in computer science. So if I want to say what's the meaning of a computer program, what's its ontological status, I just look at its translation into the lambda calculus and say this is what it means. Okay? But again, there are philosophical problems with these things. So, yeah. Okay. I think this is a good point to stop and then and, and I'm open to discussions now. Yeah. I mean, let, let me at least see how philosophy can answer. Mm -hmm. And as you, you didn't list it, but you, mm -hmm. you know, this mm -hmm. particular question, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, at least the question it has. So this autological, heterological, mm -hmm. if I say A, B, C, D as a word mm -hmm. is autological. A, B, C, D is A, B, C, D. It's not anything else. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, in, in natural language, the... No, I'm saying ABCD as a natural language term. Okay. So, all right. So, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Suppose you look at natural languages. Then the ontology there comes, the ontology there comes from the real world. If I want to say what does a word in English mean, then I appeal to the natural world. Okay. If I want to know what does A-P-P-L-E means, then I find out there is an object called an apple in the real world, and this is what it corresponds to. Uh, so that's what I'm coming to, because yeah. the po point is, yeah. uh, why in philosophy of language this is not seen as a very important question, mm. is also correct, I'm glad you mentioned this, because this is the central question of ontology. Yeah. Yeah. What is the, because first of all, uh, whether the disquotational or the quotational yeah. is yeah. having a separate significance, you know, the, the moment you put quotes on heterological, it's no longer heterological. Yeah. And that's a very important shift, and there's an implication, you know, Tarski and others. But the more interesting point to me is that the very word or the operator, heterological, does not have the same, is not the same as the meaning of heterological. Mm -hmm. So we are using the same notation for it, but they actually don't mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. So much of what you say, and I mean, what computer science is saying, is based on the fact that there is something called long, mm -hmm. independent of its language representation. And that's the ontology you're really, yeah, I think, alerting us to, right? Correct. Yeah, so I am, what I'm saying is, the idea that objects in natural language refer to, I mean, uh, words in natural language refer to objects is a very limited and a very small subset of words in natural language. Yeah. You have, of course, very, this is the critique of the denotation theory. So you have, un, in fact, millions of words, or yeah. most of the words don't refer. Right. Um, you know, the, and, is et, of a proposal, all of those kinds of numbers. So yeah. um, to use the, the, the word, and ask its, uh, you know, whether it is or heterological or autological, mm -hmm. goes against, uh, uh, you know, some of the most well-accepted theories of language, including, for example, Nyaya has, a, you know, very similar argument about fire. Mm -hmm. You know, the word fire doesn't burn you. Mm -hmm. So they are, they are re fighting against the same ontological question about, is there some commitment to something? Does language capture something more than that? So I'm, all I'm trying to say is um, that the way in which computer science seems to be using language is actually not as natural language at all, actually. No, they are not. They are completely artificial languages. You know? They are not natural languages at all. And that's why, so, so like you said, 
there is there is studies classical studies of natural language and there are solutions to some problems there are in solutions to problems but this computer languages are completely artificial and the closest that you can find corresponding to these which existed before computer languages are mathematical languages so when you try to do formal mathematics there is a fixed vocabulary there is a grammar there is a way of doing mathematics okay which is again completely artificial all right so, oh, so the no question i want to ask is is yeah. software languages then do they have the same platonism like mathematical objects are because if they see because there is no just two points very quickly on platonism because very important point and we have discussed it earlier also mm -hmm. platonism of natural languages is uh, very difficult i mean very few people try and uh, mm -hmm. make a claim for platonism of natural ob uh, natural language and also in the case of mathematics mm -hmm. we have a completely tra different tradition than the greeks including indian and chinese mathematics yeah. in which there is absolutely no mention of platonism Indian mathematics functions as effectively, or maybe whatever you know, how, yeah. depends on how you want to evaluate it, without any commitment to Platonism. So you on you so you have both the possibilities of Platonism. But yeah. when you are doing this, are you trying to say that software languages, yeah. in some sense, mm -hmm. has the same kind of ontological commitment to mathematical entities? What is it? Is software language between natural language and mathematical language in terms of ontologies? So in, let's say you accept my fact that there is no ontology for natural language. That is, words don't exist in any platonic word. You know, natural language words. Yeah. Mathematical objects exist. So Software languages, are they do they have, what is their ontolo ontology of those? So, okay, so before I answer that, even the claim that mathematical entities exist is contestable. I mean, there is, yeah, so then, so, so our, I mean, computer languages are like, like mathematical languages, they are even more artificial. There is another step further removed, so to speak. Yeah. But there, I mean, mis there seems to be some kind of, since you can execute these on, on real world computers, yeah, there seems to be some connection to, to some kind of an ideal real world outside to which you may try and attempt to map it to, but, but it doesn't work out that way. Yeah. So this is more like a completely artificial world that you are dealing with. And if you try to find the ontological status of it, and if you try to appeal to solutions that mathematicians have seemed to find. Yeah. So the current day standard, um, I mean, most people accept set theory as some kind of a platonic universe into which you can find ontological status for mathematical algorithm. I and mean, it's not universally acceptable, but to a large community of people in mathematics, set theory, I mean, set theory functions as some kind of ontological, I mean, some kind of a universe where you can try to find meanings for it, okay? So even that solution doesn't seem to help in computer science. I mean, if you take set theory as it is, as it was developed for mathematics, we find that you cannot even map computer programs to set theoretical objects straight away. Yeah? I mean, that's the word I was trying to address here, yeah. So, so you need, com I mean, this is accepting, I mean, suppose you start with the hypothesis that set theory is acceptable as a, as a ontological universe to, to, to map mathematical entities to, yeah. So you, that doesn't seem to help directly in computer science because you have to rework set theory. You need a completely different kind of um, theory if we still continue to call it set theory to be able to find meanings for computer programs, okay? But, um, so like you said, Indian mathematics, Chinese mathematics works very well. So there is this notion of formalism where you don't look at for the meanings. I mean, the meaning look lies in what can you do with these entities, yeah? So I don't try to find out the meaning of, uh, of some kind of, say, of something in, um, say, an algebraic geometry. I just look at, there are formal rules for manipulating them, yeah? So, you say, instead of trying to say what is a number, I say here is an entity. I, you can take this entity, you can multiply it with something like with it's like itself, you can divide it. These are the kind of operations that you can do. So formalism kind of, I mean, in, in very roughly corresponds to that, yeah? where, where the meaning lies in the kind of use, utility of those things, what kind of use can you put, put those objects to, okay? So, but, um, but if you try to study this notion of formalism, okay, 
So, so if you look at, uh, so even set theory, if you take it as a, some kind of a platonic universe and you look, start looking at foundations of set theory itself, then you find that set theory itself is just a formal system. It has its own rules for, for, uh, for working, yeah? You know, what can you, so, so it's just an axiomatic system where, where you never try to say, if you are in set theory, you never say what is a set. A set is a completely undefined object. And then you have rules for, for operations that you can do on sets. Yeah? You can take sets and you can subject it meaningfully, so to speak, to a certain set, to a certain kind of operation. And that's all you restrict yourself to. Okay? So, so even this, um, I mean, I said a little while ago that uh, set theory seems to be the most, uh, most acceptable solution to platonic um, foundations for mathematics. But if you look at set theory more deeply, set theory itself needs some kind of a platonic foundation. You don't know what are sets. You know? so, so, I mean, even if you accept set theory temporarily as, as a workable solution, for computer programs, they don't seem to, to suffice at all. Okay? And the other um, approach that we use in kind of a translational semantics, if I say, you take computer program, and if I want to say what kind of, what, the, what do the phrases in it, I mean, the words hydrology was just an example that I was just illustrating just to make a point. Yeah? So you try to study larger and larger entities. It's not just single words. You look at phrases, yeah? you look at uh, functions, you look at more and more structured objects and try to find meanings for all those things. Okay? And, uh, and the most closest um, solution that people have come to is, is like I said, is, is to translate it into something else, which seems to be more, which is the math, which is the lambda calculus, which seems to be more mathematical in its, in, 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 in its essence. But again, the same philosophical problems are, are still there. Yeah? Just a couple yeah. of points. Uh, what I understand is, in, from philosophy of mathematics, from my basic readings, yeah. uh, this um, uh, Russell's paradox, uh, which is related to your termination function and all that. So that seems to be a, that was a big problem in mathematics also, if I understand right. Yeah. So is there something uh, different, unique to computer programming? which is, uh, you know, which poses an ontological problem in that sense, which is different from mathematics, uh, one. And two is uh, about the list of impossibilities that you gave, you know, I found it very curious. So you said that you cannot have two whole numbers which satisfy this m square equals two n square. Yeah. And you also said that, you know, you can't have a perpetual motion machine mm -hmm. and you can't have the, you know, uh, an electron's speed and position sort of given very accurately. So are these two things similar kind of impossibilities? You know, the impossibilities m square equals two n square on the one hand, as opposed to the perpetual motion machine on the impossibility of you know speed and uh, position of electron. And so just yeah. So my question is uh, whether you know uh, you know in, in philosophy of mathematics the you know Russell's paradox. You know the question of you know barber who you know the barber shaves only those yeah, people those. who do not shave themselves and yeah. that kind of. Uh, that's and then the set of all sets. That's, mm -hmm. That is another thing that Russell has uh, spoken yeah. about, right? Yeah. So they seem to be similar. The heterological, yeah. ontological problem. Mm -hmm. So is there something, some special problem that is posed by, you know, computer languages, it's just different from uh, what you uh, see in mathematics? That was the first question. No, this example that I gave you is is precisely Russell's paradox. Yeah, there is. Um, I mean, Russell's paradox. If you want to formulate Russell's paradox, you have to start with the notion of a set, and then people don't know what is a set. Yeah? So it, it takes more kind of previous definitions, background, to be even able to state Russell's paradox. Yeah? So this is precisely Russell's paradox, but, but stated in a more popular science way, if you like. Yeah? I, mean, pe I mean, people use natural language all the time. It's, it's far more easier for people to, to uh, to be able to understand that if you are try to classify all these adjectives into two these two distinct classes, then there are problems. You know? So that's all he tries to show in that. Okay, so it's basically Russell's paradox. So so where does how does Russell's paradox work? So so there you say that all. So this Grelling's paradox is basically Russell's paradox. So so Russell's paradox you say that you are looking at. Um, so there is a notion of 
set. Yeah. So you are studying set theory, and you are looking at the notion of a universal set, set which contains all all other sets, okay. and then and then you look at self membership. Or you look at the condition that self membership is, is not allowed. So, so set is set is just an arbitrary collection. You just take any bunch of objects, you put them together, it like becomes a set. You take numbers, you, know, you take uh, you take any kind of number. So, so Russell was trying to build up foundations of mathematics. You start with with entities which are completely unstructured, and then you come up with rules which using those unstructured entities you have rules for actually how to use them how to manipulate them and then you build up other higher level concepts in mathematics okay. so set starts with completely unstructured elements so there is no relation between various elements of the set you just put them together some collection and then form the set so the only thing you can only kind of operations you can do with a set to begin with is given an element you can ask whether is this element a member of this set or is it not a member of this set okay so so i have a set s whatever it is and all i can ask is given uh, given some other object a you can ask whether this a is it a member of s so this is a symbol of membership or is a not a member of s so so rasul started out from from this so you look so so um Set can contain a set which contains the set. So you have some kind of a hierarchy here. Okay. So here we are just looking at one single level of it. So I have sets which contain other sets. And so now I ask is whether this n is it a member of n or is it not a member of n. So I should be able to answer one of these questions and with the yes answer and the other one with a no answer. Okay. So so if I take all these sets which don't contain them. Now we are back to the psychological kind of situation. If I start with the assumption that n does indeed contain n, you know, then what is this n? It's a set of all sets that don't contain themselves, which actually tells us that n should not be there in n. On the other hand, if I start, so I find a list, it doesn't seem to work, so the other possibility seems to be there. So I begin with this, so I say n is not a member of itself. So if n is not a member of itself, I look at the definition of n. It should contain all sets which don't contain themselves. So which means that n should actually be contained in in n. So, so this is basically Russell's paradox. So so you have very simple notions here. There is just a notion of membership and there is a notion of the set. Set is a collection. You don't know what what is a set. You don't you don't try check it. Doesn't try to give any kind of order which stands for a set. Hmm? So there is an operation you can subject it to. You can ask questions like this one. Given an object, is it a member of this collection or is it not a member of this collection? Hmm? And thus, and if you assume this, you can kind of satisfactorily build up a lot of other mathematics. Yeah? Very advanced notions. You can translate it down to this level. Yeah? This function is. Some kind of a machine language. You know, if you are writing computer programs, there is a language of called a machine language, which is just zeros and ones, you know, circuit breaks and circuit connections that the computer can understand. You know? So everything is basically translated to that. So set theory operates as some kind of a machine language for mathematics. And what Russell showed that was that there were problems in set theory itself. There are 
question is you cannot automatically answer it either way, this way or that way. Hmm? I mean, it leads to a contradiction. If I start with one, I end up with the other. If I start with the other, I end up with the first one. Hmm? So, the 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 we needed some kind of way to to rework this. Hmm? And there were solutions. So, a lot of solutions were proposed to to overcome this defect of set theory. And in the process of doing that, they threw away a lot of notions. The one that I listed, hmm? which seem to lead to all these problems in set theory of self application, self membership, hmm? of hard order entities. So if you reward all that, then you can salvage set theory from paradoxes. You can have a meaningful system okay? and you can do sensible mathematics with that. But if you are trying to use the same the same formalism of set theory to do to build a foundation for computer programs then you are completely hampered by the fact that you don't have those constructs available to you. That you cannot do self-application. That self-application comes up very meaningfully in the setting of, uh, of computer programs. Okay. So, so, so the standard, um, I mean mathematics is an old discipline, almost as old as philosophy. So people have grappled with problems and they have come up with some solutions. Okay. It turns out that you cannot even meaningfully adapt those to the to the needs of, of studies in ontology of computer programs. There seems I mean, you need to need something completely different. You need to build up from scratch, which is more useful you know, to to somebody trying to do classy in this in this area. So I should tell you that there is um, there's nothing original in what I told you today. I mean, there are a lot of all the stuff you will find in the literature. There is there's nothing that I've invented or this or just for the sake of the stuff. This is very standard material. And um, if, you, if you try to study philosophy of uh, programs, Studies in an area called philosophy of information, which has been evolving over the last few years, yeah, which seems to be a sensible contender for the other standard ways in which people have tried to do philosophy of computer programs. Yeah. So the no it tries to study a notion called information and then tries to ground these uh, computer programs in this domain yeah, rather, than, rather than traditional mathematical structures. Okay. So if you tend to get uh, interested in this, I suggest you also look up uh, this notion of philosophy of information, and you may find sensible readings, things that excite you to think about. OK. Um, I want to talk a bit about set theory and its relationship with computing, and also the something that you missed because you weren't here on the first few days. But there was discussion about the nature of science, and there was a claim that science still has grounded itself on the ideas of finding the essential necessities for being the member of a, of a class, for example, right? Um, so uh, science seems to be pushing towards a kind of, in its methodology, essentialism, uh, where finding the necessary reasons for being the way something is, right? There's others that challenge that, that the difference between accidental and necessary properties is uh, something that is entirely fluid and maybe even language-based. But what happens with the rise of set theory in the 19th century is that natural languages that looked like they gave the possibility towards essentialism could be, if you like, deconstructed or taken apart to be shown to be members of a set. For example, in the classic Aristotelian uh, notion, all men are mortal. There's a classic term that's used in analysis of the syllogism. Mm -hmm. Has a notion in it built in from the Platonic tradition mm -hmm. that there is 
a man, and such that it is to participate in mortality is to have the essential characteristic of being mortal as being part of man. And so that there's some kind of platonic form like mortality of which man participates in whatever the hell participates means. But with, in the 19th century when they begin to introduce uh, set theory, then that can be, that can be completely um, taken apart into a notion that there is a set uh, um, of men and there's a set of things that are mortal and then you write an equation between them. The all members of the, uh, all members of the set men are members of the set mortal. And, that, and then it's easy to mathematize that, right? You can see that there's just equations between the relationship. And, and so logic gets completely um, washed away with debates about what is the essential meaning of the terms into just being members of sets, right? And then it's possible just to run with that like crazy to be able to create a, a, um, a uh, functionalism between the parts of a sentence, of which gives us the possibility of writing computer uh, uh, programming that is, in a certain sense, meaningless, mm -hmm. uh, insofar as that it doesn't matter in the central meaning of the of the uh, the terms within it which it's uh, referenced. So there is an important development that happens with set theory that allows the possibility for draining away the philosophical import mm -hmm. that seems to be restricting the idea of creating a, a pure uh, mathematical functionalism between the uh, the parts of a sentence. So, even though it produces, it sort of vomits forth a bunch of paradoxes that gets mm -hmm. itself into hot water. Thank yeah. God, because if it didn't, then it would be <laughs> fully uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, exhaustible, right? Yeah. Uh, but that there's something important about that move to set uh, theory that destroys. I think it really mm -hmm. utterly destroys the possibility for a, a true Platonism, not a Platonism in the way that is given in the philosophy of mathematics, like there is in existence a real number two. Yeah. That's that, you know, the endless, what would you call it, scholasticism of the philosophy of mathematics that worries about such sad things. Mm. Uh, but instead, what it, uh, the rise of set theory does is, um, is uh, at attack the real Platonism is that there's a notion that there's an essential reason mm -hmm. why uh, something participates in the number two or, some, or, or, or something like that. Do you see, see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a wonderful philosophical shift that moves into um, set theory that is dissolving a lot of the philosophical debates about what, you know, why, why or uh, what import comes from all men are mortal necessarily rather than accidentally. Yeah, I think I kind of understand the import of what we're trying to say. Right? So, yeah, so like you said, I mean, sectarian does kind of resolve a lot of these issues, but, but then but there are new issues that drop up within sectarian. And you can start asking questions about, about such tensions, and, and there are no satisfactory answers to them. So, yeah. so um, so I started off by saying, this is just one other point I want to make. So I started off by saying this study of philosophy of Sarayana uh, computer programs. So it draws from two traditions, two traditions. One is philosophy of mathematics, the other is philosophy of language. And, uh, and of natural language. So like natural language, that's what I was saying, there is, there is a real world out there. You can kind of use that to come up with means. But for artificial languages, so there is So this word seems to be kind of contradictory. Science is supposed to be studying natural phenomena. What do you mean by the science of the artificial? So there is a, a very nice book of the same title which tries to address uh, issues of how to, I mean, there are no final answers to that, but uh, it does try to come up with a meaningful explanation of how would you go about trying to come up with meanings for things like computer programs, yeah? even mathematics, right? So that doesn't seem to be, you can't take this help of a natural world outside which is independent of what you have studied. Yeah? So, so I suggest that 
So I thank Raja for his talk.